Well, good morning to everybody. So good to see everybody here today. What a wonderful time celebrating uh, our VBS. I, mean, I feel so overdressed today. It's not even funny. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I'll lighten up someday and just come in here with a t-shirt. I don't know. Um, we're going to be in the book of Acts. You know, today we're beginning this new sermon uh, series through the book of Acts. Um, as y'all know, uh, a group of us went to Israel last week, and about 20 of us. And, you know, I was, I was there, all, you know, in Israel all week just thinking about, you know, what am I going to preach on? What's the next series? And, and uh, you know, I just could not get away from the book of Acts, the birth of the church. You know, we, we were standing right where all these things happened. I mean, all these things happened right where we were. You know, we're walking all over Jerusalem. We did. We walked all over Jerusalem. We walked all over Israel, but we walked all over that city, um, all over the, the Mount of Olives. Um, just incredible. All over the Temple Mount. You know, it seemed like everywhere I was going, I was like, this is where that happened. You know, or this is where that happened. And my poor boy, a couple of my boys were with me. I was like, I was like, do you realize where we are? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be in the book of Acts, where everything began. It's my prayer that God will, will speak to us through his word, revive us as a church, so that we can continue on in the purpose that he's laid out before us. And it's an incredible purpose that God has for his church and for us as Christians. Now, the book of Acts is the story of the church from its inception on the, the day of Pentecost until about 30 years later when the Apostle Paul was in Rome, he was awaiting his martyrdom. And at that point, the narrative of the book of Acts, it just kind of comes to an abrupt end. It just stops. The story's unfinished. You know, kind of like the novel Gone with the Wind, right? The, the author died before he finished the book, leaving a lot of readers dissatisfied. But, you know, ironically, it also adds to the greatness of the book. You know, it just adds to it. The, the book of Acts is like that. Acts does not have an ending because the story is still being told, even today. All of us are a part of that, that story. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if the book of Acts was to continue to be written, you would be in that story. This is the story of the church age of which we are a part. You know, from the book of Acts, we learn... <clears throat> the earliest foundation of the church. We also learn what the purpose of the church is. Now we're not gonna look at the entire book of Acts. Most likely we're just gonna focus on the, the, early, the early chapters where everything began. Luke is the author of the book. We know that he was a physician. He was a traveling companion of the apostle Paul. Luke was a historian chosen by God to give us one of the gospels named after him and also the book of Acts. We're gonna pick up verse one, chapter one. <clears throat> the former account that I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Luke addresses this, this message, the book of Acts and the gospel to Theophilus. Now we don't know anything about this person. Some people theorize maybe he was a benefactor of Luke and the apostle Paul, a supporter of the ministry. Pretty much anything that we would say about him would be pure speculation. But Luke says, in my former account, that is in the gospel of Luke, I began to write all that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up. Luke covered the, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And he then gives us our only source of information about what happened next. Luke reveals to us that strange 40-day time period from the resurrection of Christ until the ascension of Christ. Jesus died. Three days later, he rose again. And for the next 40 days, he appeared many times to his disciples in the flesh. At the end of verse 3, it says that during those meetings that Jesus spoke of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So through Luke, 
we learn that God's chosen apostles and disciples for a period of 40 days, they had constant interaction with Jesus Christ. He was risen from the dead. They spoke with him. They talked with him. They ate with him. And during that time, God revealed the mysteries of his plan. God's plan for the church, the progress of the gospel. During those weeks, verse 2 says that they were given further commandments by Jesus. Verse 3, Luke says that Jesus verified himself to them through many infallible proofs. And we don't know what those proofs were. He was physically in their presence. They could touch him. They saw the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. He ate with them. He, he spoke with them over a period of 40 days. And he revealed to them things pertaining to the future of God's kingdom. Now, this explains so much for me, but so much for all of us. You know, this reveals how it is that a group of 12 apostles, and now they were down to 11, along with about 100 other disciples, such a small group of people, that a new creation would come into the world called the church, and this body, the church, would spread throughout the entire world in just a few decades of time. It explains how Peter, who would deny Christ three times out of fear, would just a few weeks later, just a few weeks later, 50 days later after the crucifixion, Peter would baptize 3,000 people in Jerusalem in the sight of Caiaphas' house, he could, Caiaphas from his house could see where, Je, where Peter was baptizing all these people. The same Caiaphas who delivered Jesus up to Pontius Pilate. The same place where Jesus was in prison. Peter, in the, in the line of sight, he was baptizing all of these people without fear. How do we account for this change in Peter? Well, it's very clear. This is how. Because for 40 days, Peter was with Jesus who rose again from the dead. He ate with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He touched Jesus. Jesus gave him these commands. Jesus revealed to him his plans for the kingdom of God. And the result was Peter no longer had any use for fear. What could he possibly be afraid of? Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, this is what's going to happen. And he laid it all out for him. It's the same for us today. And we need to know this. We have no use for fear. We're children of God. All that Jesus revealed to those disciples during that 40-day time period, the same things have been revealed to us. We are the keepers of God's word. Now it's all been recorded for us. It's been delivered to us. And we know the word of God. We know who we are. We know why we are here. And we know what is to come. God has revealed it all through the words of the apostles. We are the church. We have the Holy Spirit within us. That's why we need to be busy about what God is calling us to do. And we're going to talk about that. But in verse 1, Luke says that he recorded all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, that's what's recorded in volume 1 of his work in the gospel. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. That is, all the miracles, all of the parables. The Sermon on the Mount, all of the teachings of Christ. But Jesus' life was cut short. He died. So the Gospel of Luke is what Jesus began to do and to teach. You know, if that was all there was, just what was recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' life cut short. Luke recorded all that Jesus had began to do and to teach, but his life was cut short because he died. If that's all there was, we would not be here today. There would be no church. There would have been no Christian movement. You know, if Jesus was like all other men and religious leaders in the world, it would have ended whenever he died. Like Moses, Moses' life was cut short. His work was not complete. It was not Moses who led the people across the Jordan into the promised land. That was Joshua who did that because Moses died. Or like David. You know, David collected all the materials to build the temple in Jerusalem. But David's life was cut short. He didn't build the temple. His son Solomon did that because they died. 
The difference between Jesus and all these other religious leaders throughout all of world history is that all those other religious leaders, they died and they stayed dead. Whatever they did during their life, that's all there was. But not so with Jesus. He rose again. And he's coming again to complete his work. This is why the church was born. This is why it exploded all across the world. Because Jesus Christ is alive. And he sent his Holy Spirit to empower us and to guide us. He's given us his word to keep us on track. And we know he's coming again. He's going to come again to the very spot where his disciples watched him ascend up into heaven. Starting with verse 4. Luke records what happened on that day, the day of the ascension of Christ into heaven. Verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, whenever they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now here we read the last words spoken by Jesus during his time in this world among his disciples. You know, if we're not careful, we, we just read this story. Most of us in here are very familiar with Acts chapter 1. You're familiar with this, with the Great Commission and with this, with this story. And if we're not careful, we'll just accept this as it is, as a story that we've heard so many times and kind of move on. But we're disciples of Christ, just like they were. All those who were gathered there on the Mount of Olives that day and heard these words of Jesus, they're just like us. We're in the same church age. We're the same disciples of Christ. And so we need to slow down on these words of Jesus. Now, this is the day of the ascension of Christ. Now, in another week from now, it's going to be the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days from the crucifixion. And that's when the church is going to be born. And we'll look at that next week. Jesus had just spent 40 days confirming the reality of his resurrection. For 40 days, the Jews in Jerusalem, Caiaphas, the high priest, all those Pharisees, they they knew that the body of Jesus was missing. I mean, the tomb that Jesus was laid in after the crucifixion was just a few blocks away from the house of Caiaphas. Everybody in Jerusalem knew that the grave was empty. In verse 4, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Again, this is all taking place just a few blocks away from where Jesus was buried. The disciples, they had an upper room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem where they had been gathering. And during that 40-day time period when Jesus' body was missing, all of Jerusalem was wondering what happened. The disciples of Jesus, they're in regular meetings with Christ risen again from the dead. And in verse 4, this is their last meeting in this world. And now they're all gathered on the Mount of Olives. This is less than a mile from where Jesus was crucified. And Jesus leaves these final instructions, these final promises at the very beginning of the church age. These promises are for us. They're for you. First of all is this. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait on the promise from the Father. And the promise was this, that not many many days from now, they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some in our church today who take this phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they take it to mean, and they've built a whole church and doctrines on this. And I'm not saying that they're horrible people or anything like that, but they take this phrase, the baptism of the Spirit, and they take it to mean that after we get saved, And the more holy we get and the closer we get with the Lord, that there's going to be a subsequent baptism of the Spirit that takes place in the believer's life. And based on the narrative of what happens next in the book of Acts, they also believe that when you're baptized with the Spirit, that you will speak in tongues. That the Spirit will come upon you, and that's the evidence of being baptized in the Spirit. What I can tell you today is that that is not accurate. The baptism of the Spirit occurs today whenever we are saved. 
Whenever we are born again, that's when the Holy Spirit of God comes into our hearts and into our lives and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. That is the baptism of the Spirit. It's what makes us born again. But on the day of Pentecost, as we're going to see, that this was a very unique day. This was the inauguration of the church age. And when the Holy Spirit fell for the first time during the church age, on the day of Pentecost, in that upper room, the disciples, they spoke in tongues. And we're going to look at this more next week, but the tongues that they spoke in were languages. This was a miracle. The gift of tongues was a sign gift for unbelievers. It was a language, a discernible language that these people could hear. There were people gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world. And all of a sudden, when the Spirit fell upon the church, they spoke in languages that these people, their home languages. These were Galileans, fishermen. They'd never learned those languages. You see, it's a sign. It was a miracle. That's why 3,000 people were saved that day. And understand this, the promise that Jesus gives us here on the day of ascension, it's not a promise of speaking in tongues. It's not a promise of being slain in the spirit in some kind of crazy experience. The promise is the coming of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. Now, there's two great promises given prophetically in the Old Testament. The first is the coming of a Savior. And the second is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. So it was in fulfillment of this prophecy that Jesus commanded the disciples to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for it. That day had come. Jesus had repeatedly referred to this throughout his earthly ministry. In the Gospel of John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus said, And I will pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. The coming of the Holy Spirit is the promise of comfort. He's called the comforter. In another place, he's called the paraclete, which means one who comes alongside. The Holy Spirit is God in us. You know, whenever I first started out in my faith, and I've shared this before, but my mother, I was 21 years old. And I was seeking after truth and reading the Bible for the first time. My mother gave me a book called The Wonderful Spirit-Filled Life, written by Charles Stanley. That was the first book I ever read cover to cover. And I read that book, and it opened my eyes to the truth of who we are in Christ. Whenever you're saved, God breathes His Spirit into you. That's what makes you alive spiritually. That's what makes you born again. That's what makes you a son or a daughter of God. It's what sets us apart. You know, the Spirit of God is sent to individuals to comfort us, to strengthen us. And during the life and ministry of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was only on Jesus. It only came upon him, not on any of his followers. And you remember whenever Jesus was baptized, he was baptized and the scripture says he came up out of the water. And as he was as he was baptized in the Jordan River and he come up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, symbolizing the Holy Spirit coming upon him. As we're going to see on the day of Pentecost, whenever the disciples, when the Holy Spirit falls upon the church for the first time in this world, it comes in the form of fire. You know, divided tongues of fire will fall upon them. And now today for believers in the church, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit has taken a normative form. Whenever we are born again, whenever we are saved, we are sealed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He breathes his life into us. You know, prior to the day of Pentecost, the disciples, they experienced the Spirit by being in the presence of Jesus. But following Pentecost, from that day all the way until today, we experience Jesus because of the Spirit who is in us. The promise of the Holy Spirit, it's a precious promise for us today. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, is the breath of God that he breathes into us. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 6, you know, some of the other disciples at this time, they, they asked, now if the coming of the Holy Spirit, if this would mark the time that Jesus would restore the kingdom to Israel, 
Is this the time that you're gonna, that you're gonna give us our freedom? You gotta understand the people of Israel, they had been oppressed by the, the Romans for many, many years. They'd been an oppressed people. And they were wanting freedom from that tyranny. Now, some read this, and maybe there's an element of truth to this, but they read this to make it uh, to seem as though the disciples were saying, are you, Jesus, going to come back now? Are you going to set up your kingdom? Is this the end times? But I don't really read it that way. Jesus had just spent 40 40 days with these disciples explaining to them the things about the kingdom of God and what was to come. I believe some of the disciples there that day were saying, are you going to free us from the tyranny of Rome? Are you going to give us our freedom? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but this is under the authority of the Father. And here Jesus reveals another powerful promise to Christians and and to the church. It's not for you to know times and seasons. You know, the, the, the times and the seasons. In other words, life's going to happen. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be things that you're going to deal with. Maybe you're going to live in a government that you don't like. Maybe you'll find yourself in an oppressive situation. Circumstances of life, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Here's the promise. It's the promise of power. So with the coming of the Holy Spirit, this is the second promise, comes the promise of power. There's something that we are to receive. It's the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And that Greek word for power is the same word that's used to describe the miracles of Jesus in the gospel that same power that was in Jesus, we're promised to have that same power whenever we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we might not know the times and the seasons. There may be things going on in our life that we're not happy about. We we don't even know the times and the seasons in which Christ is going to come back. We're told as Christians to always live with expectancy. Even Jesus gave us signs to look for that would point to his soon return. But this is what sets believers apart from unbelievers in the world. We are a people who are set apart, filled with the Spirit of God, watching and waiting for His return. And that causes us to live differently than unbelievers in the world. You know, in this world, we may seem to be without power, but there is an unseen power working in us that the world does not know. You know, this power that is within us, it's the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in holiness to stay strong in the Lord, to even face persecution, all for the purpose of winning souls into heaven, to build the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the disciples on this day, they didn't understand this yet. It was still new to them. They did not yet have the apostle Paul in his ministry like we do today. We have all the letters that Paul wrote. We have the complete record of, of the New Testament that God has given to the church. They didn't have this yet. You know, they didn't know what Paul was about to do, what he, the, 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 the churches that he planted. And he planted churches all over the world. And think about Paul. Paul had no power in this world by what the world calls power. He had no money. He had to work as a tent maker. He was dependent on other believers helping him in his work. He was not politically connected. He did not have access to jet planes or social media or any of these things. And yet the Apostle Paul walked all over the known world at that time, planting churches in every city that he went in. Even though he was persecuted, imprisoned, shipwrecked, yet the power that was working in him literally changed the world. Now that's the power that's working in each of us. We have the same power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we look out at our world and we might complain about our government, complain about things that we see. You know, that's what the disciples were doing on this day. Jesus says, are you going to set us free from the Romans? No, you're going to get power. And they didn't understand what that meant, but now we know. What changed the world? For, for the first 300 years of church history, think about it. How, how did the church grow? How was it that Christianity swept the entire world? It wasn't through war. It wasn't through weapons. Yeah, for sure, during the Middle Ages, the church did all kinds of bad things. But for those first 300 years, the church was persecuted. They had nothing. What changed the world? It was the church. Planting churches. Winning people to Christ. 
Those churches that they started in people's homes, and then they moved to buildings. They won their friends and their neighbors and their coworkers. And over time, over those centuries, so many people became Christians in the empire, it just took it over peacefully. That's the power. And when we look at our world today, maybe we complain about our government and our situation. What's the power that we need to change? Grow the church. We have to win people to Christ. That's the power that's working in us. But this is a power that's activated through humility, through surrender, through submission. Never, whenever we submit to the purpose of God for our lives, that's when that power is activated. There's one more promise here I want us to give just real quickly. It's the promise of purpose. You know, I hate, I hate to use phrases like that, you know, in this day and age, this, this Christian lingo, right? You know, you, we always hear that. You got purpose. You got a great purpose. And people get annoyed by that. But the promise of purpose. Listen, there's no other way to say it. It's so meaningful. You know what? You know what a lot of, most of us know what it feels like to feel like you don't have purpose in life, that you're just kind of existing. Maybe you've gone through a period where you feel like that. Jesus reveals to us here our incredible purpose in life. There's something for you to do. There's something for you to be. In verse 8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses to me. This is our purpose right here. You'll be witnesses to me. Witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Listen, this is our work. This is our mission. We are strangers in the earth, sojourners. We are a people who belong to a kingdom who is not of this world. And we are ambassadors of that heavenly kingdom. We have a king on the throne who is our Lord and our God. And he sends us into this world as ambassadors of that spiritual kingdom. This is why we have the promise of the spirit. This is why we have the power that he has given to us. So that we might be witnesses. You are not here for the sole purpose of building your own little kingdom. Making sure that your barns are filled up with plenty. Listen, if that's where your treasure is. That's where your heart is going to be as well. We need to turn that around by understanding what our purpose is in this world. We need to start living and working for the purpose of being a witness. Listen, understand, go out and be successful. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, whatever ladder you find before you, go and climb that ladder. Whatever ambition you have in this world, be ambitious. Go and try to be the most successful in whatever field God has put you in. Just make sure that you just don't do it only for yourself. You're a Christian. You carry the name of Christ. Do it for his namesake. You know, as soon as you start doing all those things and you start reaching for success and it's all about you and you only do it for your own namesake. Listen, if you're a child of God, God will punish you for that. He's your father. Listen, you're to do it for his glory. You know, verse eight is the great commission of the church. This is our purpose during this age, just to build his church. And if you're a Christian, you still haven't got this figured out. What, what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? Why do, you know, some of us, we go through phases. Why doesn't the Bible excite me anymore? Why do I feel just kind of spiritually hard-hearted? Why does the church not excite me? Well, it's probably because you're missing this vital truth. We have the power of the Spirit in our lives. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your lives so that you can make disciples, so that you can win the lost, build the church. You know, W.A. Criswell was a, a famous preacher, First Baptist Dallas, many, many years ago. He told a story about how right after World War II, he went on a preaching tour in Japan. He and a group of pastors, they all went to Japan on this mission trip he says it was an incredible experience. You know, in the post-World War II Japan in the Far East, there was a wide open door for the gospel, unlike any other time. And Crystal said, every single night when I was preaching, 150, 200 people would make professions of faith everywhere we preached. He told the story on one occasion, they were in a, a certain building and they had a large crowd that was assembled there. And they were listening to them preach. They were preaching through interpreters, of course. And he said, at the end of the sermon, they handed out cards, perforated cards. 
You know how we do today, and they had questions on there. If you prayed to receive Christ, check this box. If you need prayer, check, the, check this box. He said they were handing those out, and as they were filling them out, one man stood up, and he pointed to the card, and he yelled out, and he said, if I sign this card, then what? And Criswell said, when he said that, he said it burned like fire in my soul. He said, and here's why, because there was no Sunday school. He said there were no pastors. There were no churches. This is post-World War II Japan. That's not a Christian nation. There were no churches. There were no pastors. There's no Sunday school literature. They didn't even have Bibles. He said, that question just burned in my heart. He said, that question covers the gamut of the kingdom of God. It's not enough that a man be saved. It's not enough that a man be evangelized. In the strategy and the work and the patience of our Lord, there is a discipling, a baptizing, a teaching. And when that strategy given by God is not carried through, faith becomes anemic. You see, you need to know that you will be given power to build my church. The promise of purpose is the promise that we are to be witnesses for his kingdom. Now, real quickly, look what happens next, verse 9. It says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And we'll pause right there. Verse 9, they were there on the Mount of Olives, and they watched as Jesus physically just elevated right out of this world. It says that they watched. In other words, this is not something that they heard about. It's not something that they just imagined. They were all there, uh, over a hundred people. They witnessed Jesus ascend into heaven. And why were they, they were there just watching and gazing up into the heaven. That's when those angels showed up. You know, the fact that Jesus ascended up into a cloud right in their presence, it it suggests several things about the location of Jesus right now. You know, it suggests that the kingdom of God, Jesus is very near. You know, he, he ascended right out of their presence. Christ is very near. The kingdom of God, it's, it's just right here with us. It's not far away on the other side of the universe. No, it's just right here. It's just in a different dimension. You know, in our modern time, we're learning more about dimensions. And it's absolutely true. There is another dimension. And that's where the angels are. That's where the kingdom of heaven is. That's where Christ's throne is. You're not alone. You're never by yourself. There's never a time where you're outside of the eyesight of the Lord. And those disciples are standing on the Mount of Olives, just staring up into the sky. And the angels come up to them and say, men of Galilee, why are you just standing here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, he's going to return in the same way. You know, I was just there just last week, which is the weirdest thing. I was standing right there where this happened. I mean, very close. I mean, it had to be very close to where this took place. I was standing right there on the Mount of Olives, the same place where Christ is going to return. And I couldn't help but to have this story in my mind. You know, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I'm looking up. This is where the disciples stood gazing up into heaven. And I stood there just a week ago, just gazing up into heaven. And you know what I saw? I saw a blue sky. I saw clouds. I just stood there. I mean, I, I could still be there right now. I would have loved to just stay there. You know, you look out at everything that's going on in the world and all the difficulties of life and everything else. Man, just to stand there, just gazing up. But what good would that do? Jesus is going to come again. We're given these incredible promises. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We have an incredible purpose, which is to fulfill the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is for all of us to work together, making disciples, baptizing them. 
You know, if those angels, if they showed up today at our church, if the angels from that other dimension would just appear right now, what would they say to us? They'd probably say to you, look, church, the sermon's over. Why are you still sitting here? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with the truth? So are you making disciples? These promises are yours. The promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of power. The promise of this incredible purpose that God's placed on your life. Are you making disciples? You say, yeah, I make disciples of my kids, and that's great. Start, absolutely, make disciples of your children. Teach them the truth. It starts there. But are you making disciples? Are you witnessing? That's your purpose. From the very beginning, this is the purpose that God lays on Christians. Are you witnessing? God has placed you where you are. He's given you whatever blessings you have in your life, whatever position you possess. Are you witnessing? That's the purpose that God has given us. And church, let us be about it. Join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, we uh, thank you for your word today. God, your word is true. Your word is life to us. I pray, Father God, that you'll revive us, every single one of us. Revive Jefferson Baptist Church. Enliven us, God, to go out into the world to be the witnesses we're supposed to be. Take this time of invitation, God. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.